Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the fourth and final of the Freedom Basics classes. As of tonight, you will be a Freedom Basics graduate. No cap and gown, no commencement service, but you will be better positioned to attend a Kairos conference. Whether you go to one in Dallas or wait for the one here, Uh, The purpose of these four classes that you have taken is to provide a foundation, to give you a um, context from which you can, I think, better interpret what happens at the conference. So you are to be commended for completing the process. Tonight we are going to talk about A division of labor. My part, God's part. Before we go there, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, tonight our hearts are grateful and honestly amazed that there is a your part. Certainly under no compulsion to do that for us. It's only by your grace And by your mercy, that we are loved, that we are saved, that we are healed. Thank you for pursuing us. Thank you for loving us to the uttermost. And I pray that as we talk about our respective roles in the healing process, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So why do I characterize our healing, our movement toward wholeness as a division of labor? Uh, For this reason, God has created us in such a way that we have the opportunity And honestly, the expectation is upon us that we will participate in our own healing. This is not a passive experience. This isn't an experience where we come and we stand before God and we say, make me all better. Uh, In his providence, in his wisdom, he has determined that we will play an active role in that. And there will be Aspects to our healing that only God can do. But then there will be aspects to our healing that only we can do. God will not usurp our role. He will not take away our responsibility. He won't force us to do it. He will wait. He will woo and draw us through his provenient grace to himself But there is a cooperative effort between the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of our soul as well. Some may ask, okay, if there is a division of labor, what is the dividing line? How do we know what is God's part and what is our part? Well, that question could be answered very broadly, but not very specifically. You're not going to find a manual anywhere that says, this is what God does and this is what I should do. The truths that I will be sharing with you tonight are rooted in Scripture, for sure, but they're also the product of observation over many, many years of people moving through experiences of healing, moving to places of wholeness. And because God is sovereign, he can choose to work in any given situation as he pleases. He may bring about wholeness in my life in one way and wholeness in your life in a completely different way. Not to mention the multiplicity of things from which we are being healed. No two individuals are just alike. No two uh, wounds or baggage or anything else that we bring to the healing process, none of that is alike. 
We all come from different families. We've all had unique experiences that have shaped us, uh, that have given us a particular perspective, a particular understanding. And so when you're talking about literally billions and billions of people throughout history, God has a lot to work with, a lot of situations to work with. But because he's God, he's perfectly capable of working with all of them. So as we talk about the division of labor tonight, I I want you to keep in mind that we are painting with a very broad brush stroke. Generally speaking, the division I will be sharing with you tonight is true. Will there be exceptions along the way? Well, of course. God has the right to make exceptions whenever he wants to do that. As we move through the evening, uh, we're going to talk about three different topics. To begin with, I want to provide for you what I call the big picture. It is the context, if you will, for understanding the division of labor. Unless we fully grasp this context, we're not going to be able to understand the more particular ways in which the labor is divided. Then we will move into a section talking about God's part, what it is that that He does in the healing process, and then finally we will look at our part. What is the role that we play in our own healing? So the starting place is the big picture, gaining perspective, getting a context. And I think the best way to understand it is like this. Before we can fully understand what happens in the life of any given individual, we must first understand what God is doing on a cosmic scale. Because you see, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it did not only impact Adam and Eve, it did not only impact human beings, no, all of creation was impacted by the fall. Sin has impacted all of creation. Paul speaks most eloquently in Romans about how creation groans, anticipating salvation, fullness, healing, and wholeness. And so as God brings about reconciliation between himself and the world, if you were here this morning, you heard Sully talk about that that ministry of reconciliation. It's not only between God and you, it is between God and all of creation. But the model is very, very similar. And so we want to understand what God is doing on a cosmic scale in order to better understand what he is doing on an individual scale. And I think the best way to do that, the starting place, if you will, for understanding this cosmic division of labor is understanding the notion of kingdom. Kingdom. Specifically, kingdom as it is revealed to us in the Scriptures. The Bible is the story of the healing of creation. All of creation. Us and everything else. And the motif that the Bible uses in order to communicate this healing and this reconciliation is the motif of kingdom. In fact, the story of the Bible can be summed up in a single sentence. God is building a kingdom of redeemed people for himself. God is building a kingdom of redeemed people for himself. That 
is the message of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one single sentence. And what I want to do for the next few minutes is walk you through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation to show you this common thread of kingdom running throughout and how that thread of kingdom reveals the healing work that God is doing on a cosmic scale. In your handout there, you should have on page one, about two-thirds of the way down, the word kingdom repeated about eight times. Is that, we on the same page there? So, this is the Bible divided into eight large sections, and these sections are coming in order, the order in which the scriptures are written from Genesis to Revelation. And the first thing that we understand about the kingdom is the kingdom pattern, creation. When God first created the book of Genesis, what did he declare that creation to be? Anybody? Good. That's right. He said, this is good. This is very good. Now, when God puts his stamp of approval on something, that says to me, it really can't get any better. If God says it's good, it's about as good as it's going to get. It would provide for us then the pattern, the universal, eternal pattern for what a kingdom should look like. If you think about God being the king, and he's going to rule over a certain domain, he creates that domain for himself, which we call creation, and he declares that to be good. So we find God's original pattern for how the kingdom should operate in the book of Genesis. Also in the book of Genesis, though, we find the story of the kingdom perished, and that would be the fall. When Adam and Eve took matters into their own hands, when they chose to disbelieve God and to believe the words of the serpent and attempted to assert themselves as God, they essentially said, we're not interested in your pattern. We think we would like to develop a pattern of our own. And so they partook of the fruit. And just as God had declared... All that they had enjoyed up to that point perished and went away. Thanks be to God, though, he didn't dust his hands and his feet and walk away, though he certainly would have been well within his rights to do so. Instead, God promised the coming of a new kingdom. And the figure who first symbolizes this for us in Scripture is Abraham. In Genesis 12, 1, God approached this man named Abraham who lived in Mesopotamia. He was the son of a man who was the high priest of the moon god. And the expectation was that one day, Abram, as he was known then, would take his father's place as the high priest of this moon god. But out of the blue, Yahweh appears to him. The God that we know as Yahweh appears to him and says, Abram, I want you to leave here. I want you to leave your father's household, your home, your country, and go to the land that I will show you. And over and over again, God promises to Abraham, if you will walk with me, if you will be obedient to me, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Not only does Abram receive a promise to be personally blessed, but God says to him, I'm going to bless the entire world through you. And it's in Abram's story that we find the very first hint of the kingdom promised. Abram became father of the nation of Israel. 
And in Israel, we see what you might call a kingdom prototype. It's as if in the Old Testament, God is providing for us a preview of what he wants this new kingdom to look like. Where he is at the center, where he leads and the people follow. Now, because he has to work with sinful human beings, it's a complicated situation. The Israelites are faithful one day and unfaithful the next. They come running after God asking for forgiveness and help and he gives it to them and they turn right around and worship idols. And so God had his hands full working with these sinful human beings, but all throughout the first half of the Old Testament, certainly, we see, if you will, a prototype of what God wants the kingdom to look like. Not what it will look like, but a prototype. Trying to help people understand, I want my relationship with you to be different. Just as I have chosen this nation called Israel and set them apart and made them radically different from every other nation around, I want to do that with each and every individual who is a member of my kingdom. I want you to be radically different because you are going to be chosen by me. In the latter half of the Old Testament, we see this kingdom prophesied. And that's why you have the long list of what are called the major and the minor prophets. The major prophets are the big books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Sometimes Lamentations and Daniel are included in there. And the minor prophets are a string of about 17 smaller books, Obadiah and Joel and Hosea, Haggai, all through the latter half of the Old Testament. And one of the primary responsibilities of these prophets was to continually point to and prophesy a new kingdom is coming. Be on the lookout for it. God is going to do a new thing in our midst. Some people receive that news very joyfully, very gladly, and look forward to that day. Others hated it and as a result killed the prophets. But through them, God was prophesying this kingdom will come. And finally, it did. The kingdom became present in the person of Jesus. And Jesus was very clear about this. He references the kingdom many, many times in the Gospels, even saying the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, I'm it. I am inaugurating this new thing that God wants to do. I am bringing about a complete reordering of creation. Through my death and resurrection, I am going to turn right what Adam and Eve tipped over and made wrong. And this kingdom will have no end. This kingdom is not initiated by any man or any woman. No, this kingdom is being initiated by Jesus Christ, the God-man, fully God, fully man, the second person of the Trinity. And this kingdom will have no end. The kingdom is preached from the time of the resurrection to now. We are in that seventh portion, if you will, of kingdom development where we have been given the responsibility to go into all the world and share the gospel. That's what every book in the Bible from Acts all the way to Jude is about, proclaiming the arrival of this new kingdom. And we believe that one day, the kingdom will be perfected. It will come about that God will fully and completely redeem this broken world in which we live. And we read about that in the book of Revelation. That is what we are still looking for. 
is the full and final redemption, the full manifestation of the kingdom that God has been building and planning and preparing for each one of us. During his time on earth, as I said, Jesus referenced this notion of kingdom and how we can be a part of it several times. I've got two passages there for you, one from Mark and one from John. In Mark 1.15, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In other words, it's here and I'm bringing it. And all you have to do to be a member of this kingdom is to repent of your sin and believe in me. Your citizenship is changed in that moment. In John 31, 36, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The kingdom is only available to those who have been born again, who have entered into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And then finally, in John 18, 36, Jesus was quite clear, my kingdom is not of this world world. I'm bringing something entirely new. I'm going to take everything about creation that is broken and everything about you as an individual, everything about you that is broken, and I'm going to redeem it, and I'm going to make it right. And as a citizen of this new kingdom, you will walk in fullness of life. John 10.10, I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its fullness, all of its abundance. Jesus is saying, come join me. Walk away from this old broken kingdom and come join me in this new one. Now, I would not be surprised to learn that some of you are sitting there asking yourselves, well, Dan, that may be a very interesting Bible lesson, but what on earth does that have to do with my personal healing and wholeness? Well, on the second page, under the section called Our Part, I'm going to explain why this notion of kingdom is so very, very important to our healing. The key issue for us, when you're talking about our part, the key issue for us is a matter of citizenship. Citizenship. Our responsibility in our redemption is to learn to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. Paul wrote most eloquently about this transition. In Ephesians 2.19, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You no longer belong to this old, broken, messed up world. You are now in the new kingdom. Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. As Christ followers, you are different. Your citizenship has changed. Now, it's one thing to acknowledge that, to agree with, yes, I understand, and I buy that. My citizenship has changed. It is another matter altogether to live it. I've had the privilege now of traveling to India over the last 10 years. I think uh, my upcoming trip in July will be my 16th trip. And 10 years ago, 
it, it took a trip or two or three for me to finally begin to get my Western head wrapped around the notion that people in the East, specifically in India, don't just do things differently from the way we do them. They think differently, radically differently, if you will. They don't look at life the same way you and I look at life. Each one of us come to any given experience that we have with hundreds of unconscious expectations, assumptions, understandings about how things ought to be. People who live on the other side of the world, people who live in India, bring hundreds if not thousands of assumptions and expectations that are completely different from ours. For example, just a small one, here in the West, it is considered to be a sign of courtesy, of responsibility, even respectability to be punctual, to be on time. If it starts at five o'clock, the polite thing to do is to be here at least by 5.04. In India, though, an event may be billed to start at 5 p.m., but if you're the speaker, you're wasting your time if you show up at any point before about 6.30 because nobody's going to be there. They'll generally start to show up around between 6.30 seven o'clock, and there is no end time. It doesn't say from five to six or five to eight. That's rarely ever included. Why? Because the Eastern mindset, the Indian mindset, is more concerned about the relational aspect of our gathering than the time aspect. We Westerners are very time conscious. We are very focused on that. We start on time, we end on time. You show up to work on time. You clock out at the right time. You tell someone you're going to have coffee with them at Starbucks and you show up at the right time. That's not the issue over there. The issue over there is relationship. So we'll get together when we get together and we'll leave when it's time to leave. And we're not going to look at the clock once. We'll just go when it's time to go. About three or four years ago, I had to assist a young man from India begin to adapt to living here. Uh, another value difference between ourselves and Indians is uh, there is no thought to getting in line for anything. If you go to the grocery store or if you're getting on an airplane, anything that requires a line or a queue, they are completely unfamiliar with the notion. It's just everybody pile up there and get served when you manage to get to the front. Every man, every woman for himself. And that's generally the way they board and deplane when they're traveling. Whereas here in the United States, in the West, when it's time to deplane, the first row gets up and goes. And even if the people behind them are already suitcase in hand, ready to get off, what do they do? They stand there and they wait because it's their turn to go. And you wouldn't think of pushing past them to get to the front. We just don't do that. Well, on a trip about three years ago from India, I had a young man sitting with me who was coming to U of H. Very excited for his educational opportunities. Very excited to be in the U.S. for the first time. So we talked a lot about cultural differences. Well, when the plane landed and we made it up to the gate, thing came to a halt. He was literally crawling over me to get off the plane. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me give you tip number one about living in America. <laughs> you wait. You get in line. If you try to do things here like you did them in India, someone's going to punch you in the nose. He looked at me like, wait for what? Like, that's just what we do. Just take my word for it, okay? Wait your turn. 
Well, I tell you those stories to illustrate how radical it is for us to move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Everything within us wants to go back to the kingdom of darkness because that is all we have ever known. It's what seems natural. It's what seems normal. The tug of sin is powerful. It's always pulling us back into the darkness. And when we finally step into the light, it's kind of blinding. And we don't really know our way around yet. And we don't understand what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's false. We don't know the cultural norms. But the single biggest part we play in our healing is learning to live as citizens in the kingdom of God. How do you do that? You read the manual. It is the word of God that we stand upon that provides the foundation for our healing. It is what teaches us how to live in the new kingdom. The Bible is the manual, but there is a price to pay to become a citizen of the new kingdom. You must die. You must die. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is very explicit about this notion that there is no transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light without death. We follow Jesus in our own crucifixion. The point of baptism is to demonstrate to the world that we have been crucified with Christ, taken under into death, and then raised to new life, new citizens of the kingdom of God. His, Paul's clearest explanation of this transition is found in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin." The kingdom of darkness is not so much a kingdom as it is a prison. We are held captive to the devil, to our sin, to our brokenness, to our addictions, our pain, our wounds, all of the horrible things that the fall brought about. The only way to be set free from that prison and step into the kingdom of light and life is to die to that sinful part of ours. And when we unite ourselves to Jesus, when we enter into that personal relationship with him, it is in that moment that the old man, the old woman dies and then is raised to new life. The big concept to understand when we're talking about my part in the healing process versus God's part in the healing process is to understand kingdom. I am no longer in this old, dark, sinful, painful, messed up 
kingdom. Jesus has purchased me through his blood, through his resurrection. I have died with him, and I am now a citizen of the kingdom of God. And for the rest of my life, I am going to be learning what it means to be a member of that kingdom. And I am going to live in such a way that demonstrates I am a citizen of that kingdom. I'm going to learn to think like a kingdom citizen. I'm going to speak. I'm going to act. And above all, I am going to believe. I am going to have faith in the king of the kingdom. And that he has brought me over here for a purpose part of which is my redemption, my wholeness, my healing. Now, let's spend the balance of our time talking about God's part. What is God's part in our healing? When we transfer our citizenship into the kingdom of light... We are no longer empowered by our flesh, but by the Spirit. The moment we step over that line, there is a new master in our heart and in our lives. We no longer are slaves to sin, but we have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus And it is through His Spirit that we learn to live and walk. In Romans 8.11, Paul writes, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. One day, you and I will be resurrected from the dead. These these bodies that we are in right now, one day, will be raised from the dead if the Spirit of God lives in us. That's the primary qualification for a resurrection, is that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. In other words, if you are a citizen of the kingdom, act like a citizen of the kingdom. And the way you do that is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that is available to each and every citizen of the kingdom. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I hope you are beginning to get the impression that God's part in our healing has something to do with the Spirit. Jesus was quite clear that he had to go back to heaven when his earthly ministry was over. He had to. Why? Because he wanted this gospel message and his resurrection power to go all over the globe. Well, guess what? When you inhabit a body, you can't be all over the globe. Only a spirit can envelop the globe. And so Jesus said, it is good for you that I'm going back to the Father. Because when I go to the Father, He will send the Spirit. And it is the Spirit who is available to each and every one of us. And it is the Spirit who is the key to our redemption and to our wholeness. In order to live by the Spirit, we must be filled with the Spirit. Paul wrote to the Christians at Ephesus, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 
be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? In some respects, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to some branches of charismatic churches, they will tell you to be filled with the Spirit is to speak in tongues. That is the evidence that you have been filled with the Spirit, that you speak in an unknown tongue. Other uh, sects of Christianity would tell you, no, it it has to do with um, experiences, spiritual experiences that you may have. Dream dreams, see visions. That you have incredible spiritual gifts that give evidence of the Spirit residing. I was really vexed over this whole question when I was in seminary about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I would hear people stand up and give testimony to being filled with the Spirit of God and how that had radically changed their life. And I'm looking at my life and I'm wondering... I must be a second-class Christian. I'm not getting this whole filled with the Spirit thing. I mean, so I went to uh, a professor of mine who has since gone to be with the Lord, but I'm glad he had not at that point because what he said changed my life. I went to him and just poured out my heart about how vexed I was over this whole thing and how I felt like I was living a second-class Christian life that I just didn't have what everybody else had. I didn't... I was asking God daily to be filled with the Spirit. Well, he let me get it all out. And he said, Dan, the Scripture is quite clear that when you became a Christian, you got all of the Holy Spirit you were going to get. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like God filled you up three quarters of the way and then said, okay, when you really beg for it, I'll give you the rest. No, you you got all of it you're going to get when you were saved. He said, you're looking at this thing completely backwards. He said, to be filled with the Spirit is not a matter of you getting more of the Holy Spirit, it is a matter of the Holy Spirit getting more of you. Bing! Boy, the lights began to go on. It's not a matter of me getting more of the Spirit because I've got all of the Spirit I'm going to get. It's a matter of me making room for more of the Spirit in my life as I surrender more and more of who I am to Him. The key to the Spirit-filled life is surrender. It is identifying those areas of our life that we are keeping for ourselves. Secret sins, grudges, vices, you fill in the blank. It can even be good things. I mean, our children, they're ours. We're going to keep them. We got to keep them safe. I can't entrust them to the Lord. But as long as we're holding on to these other things, we're not free to receive what God has for us. And that's why he calls upon us to daily surrender ourselves. I don't know about you, but there are some things in my life, honestly, I bet I have surrendered 50 times and I have taken right back 50 times. Just cannot yet fully, completely bring myself to trust God to take care of that. On the other hand, there are some things that I have fully and completely surrendered to him. When I was a young man, I was on a, a one-way train, a runaway train toward being an alcoholic. My buddies and I would get together for one reason and one reason only, and that was to drink in order to get drunk. And one Saturday morning, after a particularly inebriated Friday night, I was at work. I was the first one in the shop. 
and I was working on a control panel and I was thinking about what had gone on the night before and I was thinking about how that probably doesn't line up with the way God would want me to live and I heard a voice that said Dan that is not for you And I turned and I looked, thinking it was my boss maybe telling me I was working on the wrong control panel, but there was no one there. And in a flash, I knew. Drinking is not for you. I haven't had a drink since. That was one of the easiest surrenders I've ever made. There are others. Haven't been so easy. Our part in all of this is to live as citizen kingdoms, uh, kingdom citizens. God's part is to provide his Holy Spirit as we make room for him in our lives. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. One of the things that you are going to experience when you attend the Kairos Conference is a challenge to think and believe differently than you do now. That will be so key to the redemptive process, to change what we believe, to change what we think, our understanding of what it means to be forgiven, to forgive, to live as a citizen of the kingdom. And there will be days when you will wake up and you will say to yourself, that is absolutely what I want to do. That is my priority, To be a kingdom citizen. I want it more than I want anything else. But there will also be days that you will wake up and the last thing that you will want to do is live as a citizen of the kingdom. That selfish, mean, sinful, addicted, wounded, whatever part of you will begin to reassert itself And you'll begin to think, why did I even bother with this kingdom stuff in the first place? I like being mean. I like being addicted. I like my woundedness. The devil is so capable of twisting our thinking in the most bizarre ways. And the last thing that you'll want to do is pray on those days. To be reminded, Lord, I no longer belong to that. I am new. So what do you do on those days when in all honesty, if you absolutely had to tell the truth, the only thing you could say is, I don't want to live like a citizen of the kingdom. Well, that same professor who taught me about what it means to be filled with the Spirit preached a sermon on this very topic once in chapel. And confessed that he had his days when he did not want to. And he shared with us that it was his practice. And he encouraged us to take up the same. On those days, he gets before the Lord and says, I confess to you, I do not want to live as a citizen of your kingdom. I do not want to live as one who has been crucified with Christ and raised to new life. I don't want it. And so I'm begging you, Lord, please help me want to want to. That was another big aha moment in my life. Up to that point, I was pretty much a prisoner to my thoughts and my feelings. I thought if on a given day, I just don't feel like it. Well, I don't feel like it. I guess maybe tomorrow will be different. Suddenly my eyes were open. No. Something can be done about that. 
I can claim my citizenship. I can live differently. I just have to change my prayer. Lord, I don't want to, but please help me want to want to. Not only are you not going to feel like it some days, but the enemy of our souls will be right there whispering in your ear every reason why you shouldn't and why you couldn't be a member of God's kingdom. But God has something different to say in the matter. And he will be faithful and he will be there for you. I am excited for you. As you launch out into this journey, I know that God has great things in store for you. And I look forward to living my life in the midst of fellow citizens of the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Thank you for the death and resurrection of your son that made that possible. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who daily empowers us to live that citizenship. I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters here gathered that each moment of every day we would be mindful of who we are and whose we are. And that we would look to your Holy Spirit to empower us to be the people you've called and created us to be. So that we might be prepared to receive all the good and all of the hope and all of the healing that you have for us. And we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you and God bless.